welcome back to the politics of survival. And I have a guest who can really illuminate us because of his background and experience and um, also wrote a book um, that's very worth reading and all of his articles that he've, he's written. Um, I'm really happy to have Scott Ritter join me today to kind of sort through the geopolitics that we're all experiencing and the censorship. So Scott, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, could you tell our listeners a little bit about you, like who you are, your book, and how they can find you? Well, I mean, who I am, I'm um, your, your average American kid uh, born in the Cold War, uh, raised by a military family. Um, I, I went in the Marine Corps, um, got my commission uh, after graduating college, uh, was an intelligence officer. Um, I served in the former Soviet Union as a weapons inspector implementing the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, I, was, I served in the Gulf War on General Schwarzkopf's staff, um, hunting down Iraqi scuds. And then uh, I guess the combination of my arms control experience, my intelligence experience, and my Iraq experience made me an attractive pick for the United Nations who brought me in in uh, August of, um, or September, August, September of uh, 1991 to head up uh, an intelligence capability within the UN uh, Special Commission, uh, the group of people. Not... <laughs> I have dogs, so we have to. That's okay. I have cats and they make noise in the background sometimes too. Everyone has a geopolitical opinion these days, right? <laughs> the dogs are, the dogs are objecting to uh, what I was saying about Iraq. Apparently. But um, mm -hmm. no, I, I was brought in to head up an intelligence uh, capability uh, to uh, because we were confronted with the situation where Iraq at the end of the Gulf War mm -hmm. was um, called upon to uh, give up its weapons of mass destruction. They made a decision not to. Uh, it turned into a very confrontational process. And I was part of that. I led uh, over 40 inspections into Iraq uh, between 1991 and 1998. Wow. Uh, I resigned in 1998 in protest over um, U.S. government interference in the work of the inspectors. Um, they were using the inspection team as a vehicle to spy on Saddam and overthrow Saddam as opposed to disarm Iraq, and I couldn't be a part of that. Um, okay. That led to a Senate testimony in 1998 where I, uh, I faced off against a, a nemesis of yours, Joe Biden. Um, he mocked me as Scotty Boy, saying that uh, I was involved in decisions that were above my pay grade. That's why they got the limousines, and I didn't. Um, he lost that fight. He had to apologize, uh, brought me in for a meeting where he, he, he apologized, wrote a letter of apology. Um, but it just underscores um, what kind of person he is when it comes to uh, foreign affairs, national security, et cetera. But since that time, I've been speaking out. Um, I made a documentary film. I've written several books. Um, my latest book is uh, Scorpion King. Uh, it, it deals with America's addiction to nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, I, I, you can get it, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, et cetera. And um, I do a lot of uh, tweeting. My daughter, when I wrote the book, my daughter said, you gotta get on Twitter to help sell the book. And I said, well, I don't even know what Twitter is. So she made me a Twitter account and uh, <laughs> I've been tweeting ever since. And um, I, post, uh, <clears throat> I post my articles and some, um, you know, 288 character analysis um, at, uh, at real Scott Ritter, it was sort of a, a riff on uh, Donald Trump's uh, <laughs> Twitter handle. All right, yeah. at real it's Scott Ritter. Okay. Um, how can people find your documentary? Is it is it searchable, and can we find it? Well, that's uh, it, you know the amazing thing is this this was one of the earliest forms of um, of censorship. Uh, you know, I, I made the film. Uh, it was called End Shifting Sands, um, and we, uh, it, I'm very proud of the film because it, it just nailed it, nailed the issue. Uh, it, it came out in uh, 2002 before the invasion and it, uh, it made the case of, uh, you know, how America was manufacturing the case against Iraq, that Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction, et cetera. Uh, and we were able to get it on limited distribution. That means that I, I showed it in certain, um, um, venues around the country at some film festivals there and it was well received by everybody but um the 
the industry came down and said, no, we're just not interested in uh, anything that gives a positive um, spin to Saddam Hussein uh, in the run-up to war. So the, the movie died a, uh, a, a, a death. Um, and to be honest, um, I, I never made any effort afterwards to, uh, to revive it. I mean, I've got the, uh, the original masters here and we, we did make some DVDs that were put out there and maybe somewhere, somehow somebody has it, but um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a relic of history at this point. Um, I've sort of moved on beyond that. Um, if there was ever an opportunity to, to, to revive it, maybe I, I would, because I, I do think that as a matter of history, it's a, uh, it's a solid piece of filmmaking, and it um, was 100% correct at a time when America didn't want to hear about what was 100% correct. And we're sort of seeing that today. I mean, it's we're, we're reliving this uh, in, in, in even more extreme fashion today. Uh, the, the suppression of uh, alternative analysis is uh, alive and well and living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we sort of saw it coming when the State Department did the 33-page report calling RT and Sputnik outlets um, propaganda and mis disinformation. And then the examples they gave were actually historical facts that were reported out in other outlets. So anyway, if you want to expand a little bit on, on what's going on right now with, um, you know, voices being suppressed. Well, I mean, it's... Um... There's a lot of voices out there that have been speaking out sometime about <clears throat> the, the dreadful nature of American foreign policy, how our country interfaces with the rest of the world. And it's, a, it's an ugly picture, uh, an ugly picture that, you know, had 20 years of uh, data points to draw upon, um, you know, the, Ill the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq, the, uh, the occupation of uh, Afghanistan and the uh, the absolute disastrous attempt at nation building that took place there for 20 years. Um, and then, you know, the, the whole issue of uh, the expansion of NATO, um, the, the challenging of China in its own backyard, you know, basically a, a, a unilateral superpower out of control. And, um, you know, these voices were starting to get traction. And, you um, a lot of the places they were getting traction because the mainstream uh, American media will not will not fund these voices, will not support these voices because the mainstream American media is bought and paid for by a corporate structure that um, is is literally an extension of uh, the U.S. government. I mean, the revolving door that takes place between the um, the upper echelons of um, of American industry, especially. Uh, military industry, but even uh, non-military uh, outlets and the U.S. government um, is, you know, is, is ridiculous. And uh, and so they're they're one and the same. And since uh, they fund media, they're going to silence dissent. Um, and you know, having one person um, tweet or one person write a blog, you know, that doesn't get much traction. It it, it tends to be. Um, you know, somebody shouting uh, in the woods. Uh, nobody's paying attention except the person shouting. Um, right. But you had, um, you, you give me an example. Um, Russia Today, RT. Mm -hmm. um, they they came in and they they created a, an outlet, um, RT America. Uh, and there's you know some 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 radio a, uh, aspects not that's not related to RT separate, but Sputnik. Uh, these are funded by the Russian uh, government uh, in cahoots with other with Russian private entities. It's not solely funded by the Russian government, but the Russian government's there. Um, and let's 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 be clear: the Russian government wouldn't be doing this unless they saw a benefit from it. But when a nation benefits from free speech, <laughs> and somebody's opposed to that, uh, the problem isn't the nation that's benefiting from free speech; it's the people who are afraid of free speech. You know, a lot of people attack RT. They say, well, you know, it's anti-American. I, I actually have had, um, I'm not an RT employee, um, but I've, I've, I've been on a number of RT um, outlets, um, you know, talking, um, providing um, uh, so-called expert opinion. Um, and they have been very professional, more professional than their, than their mainstream media outlets. 
Um, never once was I uh, told what to say, how to say. Um, they never once suppressed what I said. Um, and, and people can counter by saying, well, they brought you on because you're a safe, you know, you're, you're, you're a safe pigeon. You're going to say what they want to hear. Not necessarily. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of my own person. And sometimes uh, the, the, the knife cuts both ways. But I've never had a problem with RT. Um, they've never I have to echo me. that. You know, I'm a freelancer and I don't work for them either. But like when my story, my history with Joe Biden came forward, um, and I was being suppressed and attacked and vilified the way they vilify everyone. They want message quiet because I was telling the truth about what Joe Biden did to me when I was his staff in 1993. You know, RT didn't use me for clickbait. They didn't, they didn't handle it in a, in a very gross way like other media outlets. They were very respectful and allowed me dignity. And when I um, approached for op-eds, I've never been told what to say. Like you said, I've, you know, same thing. You know, it's just, I've never had any problem with them. It's always been very professional, very, um, and in fact, I've had quite unprofessional things said to me by corporate media outlets in the West. So yeah. I have to <laughs> echo what you're saying. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm not here to cheerlead. I'm just here to, uh, yeah. to, to basically. Um, well, there's nothing mourn. to cheerlead, Scott. RT America just shut down today. Yeah, yeah I'm, no. I'm here to mourn. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, we're, we're at one of those critical moments in, um, in American history and indeed world history where some fundamental issues are being discussed um, that relate to how the United States interfaces with the rest of the world. Uh, we're, in, we're in a transition period away from, you know, the, you know, a, a single polarity uh, based upon, you know, an antiquated rules based international order. Um, you know, which, which is left over from the end of the Second World War, where the United States emerged as a nation uh, capable of imposing its will, um, you know, its economic will, its political will, its military will, uh, its cultural will on the world. And it did so by crafting, um, you know, organizations uh, where we wrote the rules so that they totally benefited us, the International Monetary Organization, the World Bank, NATO. Um, all of these things are part of the international rules-based order. Um, and we're seeing the world maturing and saying, well, you know, that was nice back then, 70 years ago, but we've grown up since then, and we don't need to, uh, to kneel at the, um, you know, at the altar of American hegemony anymore. Uh, we're capable of, of going forward on our own, and we want to go forward on our own. We want a multipolar world. We want to Instead of a rules-based international order, we want a law-based international order where the law applies to all, where there is no such thing as American exceptionalism, where the Americans are held uh, account the same way everybody else is held account. Um, and that law is that set forth in the United Nations Charter. It's not like they want to rewrite the law. It's the law that we wrote. <laughs> we wrote this law back in 1945, and we've ignored it ever since. Exactly. And, uh, and so, you know, this is a, this is a, a, there is no better time, more important time for America to have an informed debate, dialogue, and discussion. And the thing about informed debate, dialogue, and discussion is, is that there is no one point of view. There's a multitude of viewpoints. And, and it doesn't mean that the viewpoints are divided into good versus evil, black versus white. There is a whole bunch of gray in between. There's a lot of nuance going on. Um, and and we, we should be Hashing it out, you know. There's that famous painting by Norman Rockwell about the 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 the, the, the town meeting where you know you've got this man in his probably forties, you know, leathered face, standing up, holding a paper in his hand, and he's speaking to the assembled town, and everybody's looking at him, giving him respect. But you know darn well, somewhere in the crowd, there's another man that looks just like him who's going to stand up and respectfully disagree. And he's going to give his point of view and the citizens are going to look at him and listen to what he has to say. And then a woman's going to get up and say something and Then everybody's going to consider it. They're going to sit down and they're going to talk respectfully, respectfully using fact-based argument and come up with a consensus agreement that's best for everybody. That's the way America should work, but we don't work that way anymore. We, we have a citizenry that to be honest, are the dumbest people on the face of the world about the world we live in. Um, None of I, I would dare say that 90% of Americans today right now would fail a geography test. Not only <laughs> yeah, about yeah. the world they live in. And then if you gave them 
a current affairs test. What's going on in the world? They couldn't answer these questions. They couldn't answer history lessons. You know, nothing. They're ignorant. And yet you say something like, well, what do you think about Russia going to Ukraine? Or Putin's evil. Putin's the worst man in the world. He's the new Adolf Hitler. I mean, this is horrible what's happening. Those freedom-loving Ukrainians, we got to give them weapons. I mean, you know, that's it. And well, the, pl the playbook is always the same, isn't it? You vilify, marginalize, and make it even if, if even if Vladimir Putin had a point or had you know a reason for what he was doing, it's being lost in the rhetoric. It's being lost in the message that he is the villain. And if you don't unite behind as an American behind that message, then you're a traitor. And that's the message that's being sent out quite loudly. And in fact, as you know today, America is talking about sanctioning India because they're neutral. <laughs> they're neutral. <laughs> yeah, no, this, uh, I mean, we can get into sanctions uh, and the futility of that. You know, I, I've seen this before. I, you know, I, I, I was very vocal in my opposition to the Iraq war. Um, I, I took a very aggressive stance against uh, the case being made by the United States. What I, did you think of Condoleezza Rice getting on a, a weekend program <laughs> talking about how sovereign nations shouldn't invade another? Nodding her head. Well, it's the same thing I think about when I see... Um, all these generals who were uh, involved in the invasion in 2003, speaking about, you know, the 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 you know how how bad it is that a nation would dare violate the sovereignty of another nation uh, and invade. And I'm like, well, dude, you did it. But the one thing I, I you know, I, the one thing I learned about that is the truth is a very very good ally doesn't help you in the immediacy of the moment when everything is conspiring against the truth. But, you know, I, I took a stand that was a fact-based stand based upon my seven-year experience as a weapons inspector. And I said, there is no evidence that Iraq uh, at the time retained weapons of mass destruction. Um, this went against the grain of everything the U.S. government did. I took my argument public. I went, when the, when the U.S. media shut me down, I went to Iraq and I I spoke before the Iraqi parliament and I said the same thing I said back in the United States. They got to let inspectors back in or you will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are no weapons, so you should not be afraid. I was called, you know, Saddam, Stooge, Shill, yeah. whatever you want to say. They, I was called every name in the book. Um, and they came after me. When I, when I started to speak out, I had the, you know, a CIA guy tell me, you know, the FBI is going to come and beep you in the beep. Um, and I was like, wow. yeah, bring it. I don't, and, and they did. I mean, it was hard, but they did the truth, describe the truth, that time. What happened as far as a blowback for you in the United States? Well, the very first thing that happened is the day I resigned, um, CBS uh, Evening News, Dan Rather um, published, you know, that uh, Scott Ritter, the UN inspector who resigned, is under investigation by the FBI for spying for the state of Israel. Oh, geez. So right off the bat, they have to stop it. But they were they were charging me with espionage charges that bring with it the death penalty. Now, they weren't going to execute me. Um, and I was never going to be found guilty because I wasn't. You know, the, what, what had happened in 1995, because the U.S. government refused to assist with the uh, analysis of U-2 spy plane photographs, um, I got permission from my boss, the U.N. boss, and the CIA to take the U-2 film to Israel, where the Israelis would... Uh, help us with photo interpretation and target identification. It's a very secret program, very classified program, uh, but I had the permission of the U.S. government. Um, you know, I, I would literally write out in a document saying, this is the film I'm requesting. I would send it to the U.S. government. They would give me the film. But because somebody in the CIA was angry with what I was doing, they turned to the FBI and said, he's giving secrets to the Israelis. And the FBI began a, uh, an investigation. Um, a very serious investigation that cost me a lot of money when at a time when I wasn't making any money uh, to finally get them to back down. I mean, if you, you know, there's a, um, uh, uh, there's a famous prosecutor or infamous prosecutor, uh, Betty Jo White. Uh, she was the, the, the head of the Southern District of New York and she never lost a case. And when Betty Jo White got her fingers into you, you caved. And I mean, there, you know, there was a time I, I, I voluntarily went to the FBI where they took me into a room uh, with shackles. And I'm like, you guys are really going to shackle me? They're like, well, it depends on how your answers are. I said, all right, let's do this. 
by the time I finished, there were three FBI interrogators in there. One got up and walked out. He was ashamed. The, the lady was crying in the corner and the other guy was blubbering how sorry he was that they were putting me through this because I was able to prove with documents and everything that I had done nothing wrong, that this was a setup. And they finally dropped the case. But I mean, Good. that's Good. five years later and, you know, $65,000 later. Oh my and you're, you know, when you're, when you're trying to raise a family with, you know, twin daughters and, uh, and, 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 and young marriage, that's a lot of stress. But this is the kind of garbage that the U.S. government does. Uh, when they don't agree with you, they come after you, they try to destroy you. And, um, you know, we're probably going to see some of that uh, nowadays, you know, where they, you know, as you know, um, you know, instead of engaging in a, in a fact-based discussion, um, they go low. You know? Well, they, they switch and bait, right? They distract with another discussion. And, so, and you know, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I've kind of put it out there you know, and, and then I want to get back to the geopolitics of it, that I really saw this coming. And in 2020, there's some interviews with me where I said the Biden administration is going to try to go to war with Russia. And I believe that. And people kind of thought I was being, you know, overzealous because of what happened to me, that I was just being emotional. But no, I was going by like kind of what you described data points and historical f- what's leading up to this. Plus I know these people, some of the people still there with Biden with their mics off. I know what they're doing. They talked openly and I was a low level staff way back about never allowing Russia to be an economic force in the world ever. And this is all part of that, that, you know, trajectory. Um, but really I, I want to get back to the facts. My listeners are hearing one narrative now, especially with shutting down RT and that voice and other voices, um, and other anti-war voices, as a matter of fact, could you kind of give your analysis and, and historical context to the Ukraine crisis and what's been happening the last eight years as Vladimir Putin was trying to go with the Minsk II agreements? Well, I'm, 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 I think everybody need, you know, understands that this is a crisis that has its roots in the dissolution of uh, or the fall of the Berlin Wall and, um, and the question of what to do about Germany. Uh, it, when the Berlin Wall fell, um, you had 400,000 Soviet troops in occupied East Germany. People need to understand, Germany got its butt whipped in World War II for a reason. It's a horrible nation ruled by Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. And uh, the, the world came together and, uh, and beat them. And it was, there were occupation zones. Um, those occupation zones quickly became a Cold War uh, division line between the West and the East um, over ideology. Uh, you know, the West thought that the Soviet Union was going to, you know, come across and take over all of Europe. And the Soviets were concerned about, you know, Western uh, economic pressures, et cetera. Um, and, and so Germany became divided. Uh, and Germany couldn't really reunite unless there was a peace treaty. There was no peace treaty in 1990. And so the Soviets said, look, if you want a peace treaty, if you want to end the state of war, if you want to end the state of occupation, if you want us to leave East Germany, we need guarantees that if Germany reunifies, that the Eastern part of Germany will not become a NATO knife in our back that you can't deploy NATO forces that, uh, that are currently in West Germany into East Germany. Um, and not only that, you know, as things change in the Warsaw Pact, you, you can't go, go once you go in even further east. And so the West gave Gorbachev all of these guarantees. They, uh, you know, <laughs> one after the other came down. In writing or in verbally? Well, we're finding out that, uh, that I mean, they, they found one there's, archive. Yeah. There's, 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 there's an archive that that discusses um, these 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 agreements as if they were in writing, um, as if they were formal agreements. Uh, they 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 speak of them in that way, but nobody's actually produced um, an agreement. But even if it's a verbal agreement, I mean, what kind of nation are you to give an agreement and then go back on it? Um, you know, it, it, we know the answer now. But the, uh, the, the fact is the, the, the Soviet Union was, was given a guarantee. But when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Warsaw Pact collapsed, um, 
nobody respected the Russian Federation that came out of it. I mean, we had people like Michael McFall, um, you know, join uh, the the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, a carpetbagger. Uh, you know, that's a term Americans use to refer to Northerners who went to the South after the Civil War for economic exploitation. And right. so you had a whole bunch of American carpetbaggers and European carpetbaggers going into the uh, the former Soviet Union, going into Russia. <clears throat> And exploiting them economically. Um, they weren't there to promote democracy. They were there to promote a system of government that allowed them to uh, generate as much profit as possible at the expense of the Russian people. This was about the exploitation of Russia, not the, the friendship. We, we treated Russia as a defeated enemy, um, and we humiliated Russia. Now, it just so happened that Russia had a very weak leader named Boris Yeltsin, um, who you know had had some personal issues and and such, uh, but nonetheless, even Yeltsin realized that he was getting the short end of the stick, and he begged the United States, his good friend Bill Clinton, not to be so hard to to listen to the Russian concerns, especially when it came to the expansion of NATO or the bombing of Belgrade, um, and Clinton ignored him, and and near the end of Yeltsin's presidency, you know we we know this now um, for certain because the National Security Archives has released um, the phone calls, transcripts of the phone calls between Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin during this time. And if you read them, it, it makes you ashamed to be an American and you feel the humiliation of Boris Yeltsin. It's, it's, this, it's painful to read these things. Uh, and near the end of Yeltsin's presidency, when you look down at the list of the Russians that are listening into the call, you see a name, Vladimir Putin. Putin was an eyewitness to the humiliation of Russia and the Russian president at the feet of a United States that just simply didn't care about them, who lied to them, who exploited them. So when Putin came in power at the end of 1999, early 2000, um, you know, his goal was to restore Russia to, to a level of dignity, not dominance, but dignity. And one of the key aspects of that was to, to define the relationship with the West. And he he mentioned in his speech the other day uh, that he, he had a conversation with Bill Clinton. And he said, you know, you guys are afraid of Russia. The best way not to be afraid of us is to let us join NATO. What would it take for us to join NATO? And Clinton ignored him and instead sent the CIA to Chechnya to, uh, to work on how to kill Russian soldiers uh, and continue the exploitation of Russia. Uh, Putin became a thorn in the side of all those um, you know, so-called pro-democracy Americans that were trying to, you know, reform Russia and their vision during the Yeltsin years. People like Michael McFaul, who went on to advise uh, President Barack Obama um, about Russia and then became an ambassador. And uh, Madeleine Albright, time, who worked closely with Joe Biden. Madeleine Albright. I mean, they're, they're just a whole host of people who are, um, you know, who, who did, not, did not do Russia uh, any favors. But the, 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 the bottom line is, uh, you know, Putin identified early on that a fundamental problem that Russia was facing was the issue of NATO expansion. Uh, in fact, in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference, Putin gave a speech that should go down in history as one of the greatest speeches of any politician in modern times. Yes. Because it is. It yes. literally is. I mean, it's, it's a perfect speech. And he just, he's in front of an audience of people who think he, because they invited him there, as the keynote speaker, that he's going to, you know, bow down before them like like Boris Yeltsin did. Instead, he stood up in front of them and just chided them, told them the truth, uh, told them about, you know, America's invasion of Iraq. Only one nation invades other nations. One nation operates above the law, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. And he made it clear that NATO expansion was intolerable. Nobody listened to him. They gave him short shrift. Um, he he you know, talked about the lack of balance in the unipolar world. He used the term unipolar and the mm -hmm. West. Yeah. No, and, but this is the thing. When people say, well, God, I'm surprised. Putin's irrational. Um, he, he acts on a, on, on a whim. He's, you know, he, he, you, he's unpredictable. No, he's the most predictable leader there is. First of all, he's the only leader in the world today that's been around for 20 years. <laughs> he's yeah. dealt with five presidents. Imagine that. Every time an American president comes in, our policies go through a 180-degree 
uh, you know, uh, yo-yoing. Well, and, and how they push back on that, though, Scott, is they'll call him an autocrat and say, yeah, he's been in power for 20 years. But you have to look at the U.S. Senate. They're practically fossilizing in their seats. Nancy Pelosi, Dianne <laughs> yeah. Feinstein and that power and the power grid behind it. OK, I was there in 93. I was there in the 90s. Some of those people are still there. You don't see them. You don't see their names, but they're there behind the scenes. And I know who they are. And and if you look, you can find out who the staff is and they've been there for years. There's no so they can't really point the, the finger there. But it's not just that. It's, it, it's as if Putin, you know, during this time, you know, the, the, the CIA and uh, MI6 were actively conspiring to in, in the guise of pro-democracy, promoting pro-democracy, conspiring to push Putin out of power. I mean, most they Americans still thought they that still was, are. They now yeah. a bunch of people from blue checks and Democrats are talking for about regime change, which translation means trying to get Putin out. Yeah. Yeah. Which is dangerous, dangerous rhetoric from people in power, just kind of banding around Twitter. That's really stupid. Um, could you talk a little about after 20, two, you know, 2007, then 2014, Medon? Could you talk a little bit to our listeners about what happened there? Because they're ignoring, um, there's another you know, side to this that is not being hurt. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, again, though, you got to go back in, in, in history. And I'll, I'll just say it, in 1997, I traveled to Ukraine to meet with uh, then President Kravchuk and his uh, national security staff and the uh, Ukrainian uh, SBU, which is their version of the KGB. I was sent there by the United Nations because um, Ukraine was one of the most corrupt nations on the face of the earth. And they had an extensive amount of um, former Soviet industrial facilities uh, that produced you know, a wide range of things, including ballistic missiles. And they had individuals who were dismantling these and selling them on the black market, uh, including to Iraq. And so I came in, in in an effort to get them to stop this. And I left Ukraine um, convinced that it was literally the uh, festering cesspool of uh, corruption. It was a hopeless country. Um, wow. You know, it, it, it just just nothing going on. And, and apparently everybody else shared that uh, point of view. I think in 2004, they had a, uh, something called the Orange Revolution where uh, enough um, Ukrainian citizens got fed up with the old Soviet, um, uh, you know, Kravchuk regime and they rose up in the, in the streets and they threw them out. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that's democracy. No. In Ukraine, the power isn't in the people. The people have no power. The power is with the oligarchs, uh, these, these economic powerhouses who, at the end of the Soviet Union, came in and stole, literally stole um, these, these large factories, took them as their own, and then sold off the factories. Or they took over, for instance, Ukraine has, power, you know, has coal. These guys took over coal mines and made it their, their own. And now they're billionaires. They took over nickel mines and, and other uh, minerals. Um, you know, so you have these oligarchs, uh, aluminum, uh, that are hugely rich, and they pull all the strings in, in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, they're the ones who got tired of Kravchuk. They're the ones who arranged the, uh, the so-called Orange Revolution. And then they brought in these figurehead uh, so-called you know, democratic leaders. Um, and these democratic leaders <clears throat> were supported by the West because they, the West wanted them to have Ukraine veer away from, you know, its, 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 its historical uh, connection with Russia and join the European Union because it's part of the overall Western strategy of containing Russia, destroying Russia, dismantling Russia. And they viewed Ukraine as the crown jewel in that effort. Um, and so, you know, on and on this went, and you and you saw, uh, you know, a, a variety of leaders leave, and finally you got a guy named uh, Viktor Yanukovych who uh, who became the president, and he, um, I think he was elected maybe around 2010 or so, uh, but he, you know, he worked hard to, uh, to 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 deal with this issue, and he he approached the EU. He there was talk about him signing um, an agreement with the EU, but. He also talked with the Russians and uh, the, the Putin government won out, convinced him that his long term interests were better off aligned with Moscow. And so what happened in 2014, <clears throat> the um, 
the, the, the United States together with the British and the European Union uh, helped foment a, um, an uprising, the, the Maidan Revolution. Now, what's important here isn't, isn't that they, they brought people in the street. Yes, there were people in the street, trust me. It was, you know, the, the, the people are always used uh, in, in movements like this. And people came out to protest. Uh, they, they sincerely wanted to be part of the EU. They sincerely were opposed to the decision that Yanukovych made, but it was a peaceful protest. The CIA brought in a very dangerous element in Ukraine, and that is the ultra-nationalists out of Lvov in Western Ukraine. Uh, people are more or less Poland. And these are the people that have strong neo-Nazi elements. I mean, they, 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 they worship a man named Stepan Bandera, <clears throat> who was a Ukrainian nationalist who sided with Adolf Hitler during World War II, um, they, they honor the Ukrainians that served in the Waffen SS, uh, you know, Adolf Hitler's stormtroopers. Um, these are the people that, you know, that pulled the triggers on the rifles that killed 30,000 Jews in Bobby Yar. Uh, these are the people that ran the concentration camps. These are the people that ran the death groups. These are all Western Ukrainians. Um, and they, they, this ideology festers in Lvov. And they brought that out of Lvov into the streets of, uh, of Kiev. And they, um, they, they turned a, a, peaceful a peaceful demonstration into a violent insurrection and revolution. They ended up ousting uh, Yanukovych and replacing him with a government that was handpicked by the United States. One only needs to refer to the intercepted phone calls of Victoria Nuland, who at the time was a State Department official running um, the, the, the Ukraine a portfolio where she is talking about the different parliamentarians that the U.S. controlled and which one we wanted to be doing what. Um, you know, and, and we also need to know that at this time that Joe Biden had the Ukraine portfolio with the Biden administration, with the Obama administration. So he was sort of the czar overseeing this entire effort. So Nothing he was getting he economic was gain? At that time, I don't know. I know that afterwards he... Um, he got his son a position with Burisma, a, uh, a Ukrainian uh, energy uh, conglomerate, uh, and his son made a ridiculous amount of money for doing nothing in a job that he was totally unqualified for. Thirty thousand um, dollars U.S. dollars a month, I believe, is what the one of the figures was. But they, I, like the <laughs> corporate media calls that disinformation. How do you how do you counter well, it's that? It's not disinformation. <laughs> nobody nobody is nobody has. Um, it, it's indisputable. The, the records exist. Nobody's saying that Hunter Biden didn't work for Burisma. Nobody's okay. saying that. Okay. Everybody agrees. Hunter Biden worked for Burisma. Nobody's disputing the amount of money that Hunter Biden made for Burisma because it's a, it's, it's, it's a fact. It can't be disputed. Um, and Joe, and and Joe Biden had the, had the investigation shut down on international television. He talked about it, firing the right. prosecutor. Now, this, is, this is where we get into the... Um, the, the, the controversy, because now it comes down to spinning it. He wasn't firing the prosecutor because he's going after his son. He was firing the prosecutor because he was he wasn't fighting corruption enough. I mean, this is where, you know, they've they've um, they've they've confused the debate. And anybody who dares speak against the official um, narrative is accused of Russian disinformation. But the bottom line is a son who was unqualified for anything. And again, I, I'm not here to exploit human frailty. No, I, I, I'm one of these guys that wishes Hunter went out and got all the help in the world he could get. But the, the reality is Hunter Biden <clears throat> had no qualifications. Um, he got a job that he, he, where he did nothing His, and, and he received a lot of money doing it. And you have to ask yourself, well, what was the role? Why did Hunter Biden do this? And the only logical explanation is that Hunter provided indirect access to his father, who was the sitting vice president of the United States. Um, you know, that's, that's the explanation, that's the accusation that's put out there. And, um, but we can't have a discussion about that because anytime it's raised, uh, people go, whoa, 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 that's disinformation. You can't, so you there's can't go been, down like Yeah, there's been no investigation into Joe Biden for those economic ties that happened during his time as vice president. Is that correct? And nobody's asking the question why we're going to, uh, why, why we're involved in this fight in Ukraine right now. Um, right. You know, but the bottom line, though, is that after Maidan, these uh, neo-Nazis, uh, and, and again, I mean, the fact is they only constitute 
you know, anywhere between 12 and 19 percent of the electorate. So they can't win um, the presidency on their own. But what they do have is violence. It's like Adolf Hitler in the early days of the Nazi party, the brown shirts. It's armed you know, militia. They, yeah, they, 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 they couldn't win the vote, but they could sure as hell beat everybody up. Right. Um, and that's what these neo-Nazis do. And so they, they started um, compelling the new Ukrainian government to uh, enact extreme policies, such as banning the Russian language. Um, and, and we could go on and on and on, but the, and, 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 you know, Russia, Ukraine has a significant Russian speaking population. And uh, in some areas of Ukraine, they are the majority of the population. And, and that's the Donbass region. Donbass region, Crimea, um, Odessa, um, the whole area in the south they call Novaya Russia. Um, you know, it's all the Kharkiv, the, 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 the second largest city. The, you know, and these people spoke up and they started to protest. And so the, the, the government in Kiev put these neo-Nazis on a bus down to Odessa in May of uh, 2014, a few months after the Maidan revolution, and there were street fights. And um, about 150 of these uh, pro-Russian people were cornered and shoved into a building, a uh, house of culture, I believe it was, which was then set on fire by the neo-Nazis and uh, 40 and 50 people burned to death or suffocated to death. Um, this resonates with every Russian speaker in, in, that, in, in Ukraine and in Russia who were looking on in, in alarm saying, my God, what is going on here? The, the citizens in Crimea said, we're not playing this. They, they voted and um, they, they got annexed by Russia. They, they said, nope, nope, we're not gonna be a part of this. Um, the citizens in Lugansk and, 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 and Donetsk and the Donbass um, said, we don't wanna be a part of this either. Uh, the neo-Nazis came down and started engaging in street fights with them. So they declared uh, independence. Now, the curious thing about this is when they declared independence, they thought they were gonna be treated like Crimea was. They thought Russia would just absorb them. Putin said, no, you're part of Ukraine. You're, I can't take you, you're part of Ukraine. Crimea was never really part of Ukraine, so we brought it in. But you have, you are part of Ukraine. And um, I, I can't recognize, I'll, I'll give you assistance to resist this, but I can't recognize you. What Putin instead did, it went to the, the Ukrainian government's part of something called the Normandy format, and that includes Germany and France. Um, and they negotiated what, what are called the Minsk Accords. Uh, and one of the key aspects of the 2015 version of the Minsk Accord is that uh, the Ukrainian government will recognize a special autonomy for Lugansk and Donetsk. It gives the Russian speakers the right to speak their language in, in school and to have their own education system, et cetera. They're still part of Ukraine, but they get to speak Russian. And in, in agreement to that, the, uh, the, the two republics would say, no, we're not independent, we're part of Ukraine, and everybody would live a happy life. Um, but the nationalists, the neo-Nazis, refused to allow this to happen. And instead, they formed military organizations called the Azov Battalion. It's really more like the Azov Brigade, uh, multiple battalions. And then there's other variations of these neo-Nazi uh, militarized units uh, to fight in the Donbass. Uh, and, you know, there's been a war since 2014 where 14, 15,000 um, Ukrainians, the majority of whom are either innocent civilians on the Russian side or um, military personnel from the uh, Russian side, uh, you know, fighting, uh, are, have been killed. These uh, Nazi units became an embarrassment to the uh, Ukrainian government. So did they disband them? No. What they did is they brought them into the formal military structure of the Ukrainian military. So now the Ukrainian military has broken these battalions up, and in each brigade, that operates in the East, they have a Nazi battalion, a Nazi battalion, people who wear Nazi uniforms, people who parade um, in honor of Nazi uh, 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 heroes, um, uh, you know, uh, people who have endorsed this ideology. And they're, they're now, they infect the entire Ukrainian military. And this is the military that the United States has been training with. I mean, there's embarrassing photographs of American military personnel um, in Ukraine training uh, people who are members of the Azov Battalion. We are literally training Nazis. Uh, um, yeah. And it's, 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 it's shocking. And so yeah. this is a situation that 
that that that that that existed, and you combine that with NATO expansion, and it became an intolerable situation for Russia. And Russia put the you know, Russia hadn't been silent. Russia had been speaking about this, but in December of last year, uh, Russia finally said enough is enough. They gave um, they gave NATO and the United States um, their demands in the form of uh, a draft treaty, uh, and that that required uh, you know Ukrainian neutrality. It required all NATO forces out of Ukraine, um, and it, it it also said that NATO has to withdraw um, the the its military uh, structure um, back to the 1997 lines. That is back to before NATO began um, um, expansion. That doesn't mean dismantling NATO. It just means that you can't have French troops in Poland. You can't have British troops in Latvia. You can't have American troops in Estonia. Everybody has to go back to the 1997 lines. And this is the new European security framework that Putin is describing. Uh, he said, you have to, you guys have to listen to me. You have to give me a response in writing. You have to take this seriously. We ignored him. Uh, we gave him a response in writing that said, we're ignoring you. Um, and in response to being ignored, Putin invaded. I mean, this is, a, this, is, this is a situation that the West brought upon itself. And the sad thing is, Ukrainians have been sacrificed by the West. They were never going to let Ukraine join NATO. Never. They were they using will. You, they uh, Although they're will. applying for the EU, as you know. Even the EU right now, um, they, they would, they, the, the EU's rules prohibit um, Ukraine. And then, and, then, and then the fact, EU has to understand that although the EU is violating its own rules, uh, providing weapons to Ukraine, but um, I think everybody in Europe understands that within a matter of days, if not, you know, a few weeks, there will be a new reality in Ukraine. Um, you, you know, Scott, I wanted to ask you, you know, because a lot of the listeners are hearing the, the, the West media say, well, we're saving a democracy. And that's, uh, that's a myth. Um, could you explain why Ukraine is not a democracy? Well, let's just start with this current election, um, the, the one that brought uh, Zelensky into power. You have a, um, a, an incumbent president, um, Poroshenko, who is a billionaire off of a um, off of a chocolate, uh, you know, uh, empire, um, self-funding, supported by other um, uh, uh, oligarchs, uh, who basically bought his way into the presidency, um, and he's challenged now by Zelensky. Not because Zelensky's challenging him. Zelensky's a comedian. He has a very po- he had a very popular TV show where he played a president. Um, and so Ukrainians looked at him and said, oh, he's the guy that plays president on TV. But he was supported by a, a competing oligarch to Poroshenko, who ran the, the, the media empire that Zelensky's shows were broadcast on. Um, so we can't speak of Ukraine being a democracy because the people had no choice in who they picked. The oligarchs picked them. Yes, they voted for people on election day, but it wasn't as though they, they said, you know, we want Zelensky. He went through a nomination process, et cetera. He was imposed on them. And then when he became president, he had to respond to the oligarchs. And, you know, one of the things that happened last year is because of all the pressure that's put, put on Zelensky, um, he shut down all opposition. He arrested the three opposition political leaders who could have uh, opposed him. He shut down their newspapers. Uh, there is no freedom of speech. Um, there is no democracy. He's a dictator. He is literally a dictator. And to call him, you know, this, 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 the leader of a democratic Ukraine um, is, is just ignorant because history, the facts don't, don't support this. So here we are in this moment. And I know that there's been talks about, um, you know, here we are. And there, the Western media is now calling Vladimir Putin a madman you know, and and labeling him a villain, which is predictable. I mean, that's how they vilify and and marginalize leaders. Like they did Gaddafi, like they did others, Um, you know, whether for valid reasons or for not. And he's basically protecting Russian borders from nuclear weapons. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when I heard Zelensky talk about nuclear weapons coming back into Ukraine and putting them on the borders, I saw that as a very big red flag and I'm not Russian, you know, but I mean, if there were nuclear weapons on the Canadian border or the Mexican border, wouldn't America respond the same way? And I guess, could you talk a little bit about that? And am I right to project that kind of question there? 
Well, let's let's start with you know where where Zelensky is coming from. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, Ukraine found itself in possession of, uh, or, or I won't say possession. Ukraine found uh, that there were between three to five thousand nuclear weapons on its soil. Now, Ukraine didn't possess any of these weapons. They were all in the control of the Soviet army, which became the Russian army. Now, even though certain aspects of the Soviet army were assumed by the Ukrainians as the new Ukrainian army, the strategic rocket force and the 12th, um, the, the 12th department or directorate of the, of the KGB, which guards uh, nuclear weapons, all were taken over by the Russian government. And the Russian government let it be known right off the bat that if the Ukrainians tried to se uh, seize a single nuclear weapon, uh, that Russia would come in and, and crush them like, like bugs. Uh, so the Ukrainians never controlled any nuclear weapons. All the launch codes, all the security codes, everything were controlled by the Russians in Moscow. But the weapons themselves resided on Ukrainian soil. Um, now, Ukraine recognized early on that uh, nobody in the world would recognize them if they tried to be a nuclear power. So Ukraine rejected these weapons and, and agreed in 1991. They signed agreements to get rid of these weapons. Uh, they signed another agreement in 1992. But then what happened is because Ukraine is a festering cesspool of corruption, uh, their parliament literally met and said, hey, why are we giving up these nuclear weapons for free? Let's pretend that we want them and then the West will pay us <laughs> to get rid of them. And they did. The West ended up paying Ukraine around $750 million. The Russians forgave $1.9 billion in, uh, in, in debt uh, so, so they could get rid of these weapons. Um, and in 1994, um, you know, as part of this, this, this grift, because it, it is a grift. It's not about Ukraine being really concerned about anything. It's a grift to get more money. They, they got an agreement signed, I believe, in, in, in Budapest that... Um, that, that says if, um, if Ukraine is to give up these weapons, which they already gave up, by the way, um, then the, the Russia and the West, all the signatories, will guarantee Ukraine's security, that nobody will invade Ukraine and all this stuff. So everybody signed that. Um, but, so, but there's a myth now that Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons. Ukraine never owned any nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons... The, the nuclear aspect of weapons were never produced on Ukrainian soil. So it's not like they had a nuclear weapons program that needed to be dismantled. They just had some weapons that eventually got returned to Russia, and that was that. Um, but when, and after 2014, when Russia took Ukraine, or took Crimea, <clears throat> the, the Ukrainians were screaming, hey, they violated the 1994 agreement. The West has to come to our assistance, et cetera. And, Everybody in the West went, no, no, this is a little bit more complicated than that. We're not, we're not coming to your assistance. And so Zelensky took this to an extreme when he said, you know, we signed this agreement to get rid of our nuclear weapons. Maybe we should have kept them. If we had nuclear weapons today, Russia wouldn't be threatening us. Um, but, so, you know, Zelensky was, was speaking about weapons that he, that he didn't have. I mean, it's... it's just a, Rather dangerous rhetoric, I would say. Very dangerous, but now, now what we're finding out is that the um, the uh, head of Russian intelligence is coming out and saying, "Well, wait a minute, we have information that the um, that the, the the Ukrainians were seeking in secret to get nuclear weapons." Now, now, I don't know if this is propaganda. I don't know, you know, what what's going on because I haven't seen any data to back it up. And frankly speaking, my my understanding of uh, of Ukraine's uh, industrial infrastructure is that it's not conducive to producing nuclear weapons. So I think the Russians are engaged in a little bit of counter, counter propaganda on their own here to highlight. But what Zelensky said was just stupid because it exposed him. Because nobody's going to sit there, even, even though somebody with knowledge says, well, he, he doesn't have nuclear weapons, so it, it, it's crazy for him to be talking this way. The point is, it's crazy for him to be talking this way. It's dangerous rhetoric. That, um, that the Russians have jumped on. Well, you know, and here we are with Americans um, participating and, the, and America does actually have, you know, and so now you have two superpowers um, that are engaging in this discussion. Now you're listening to the rhetoric, um, you know, through, you know, your lens, which is coming from a weapons inspector lens, like your past work. Is, is this something to be concerned about 
are we heading towards a war with Russia basically? Um, and how does this rhetoric get dialed back? So what, where are we and what are you hearing really underneath? Like there's the, there's the message, but what's the message underneath? Well, the message underneath is nobody wants a nuclear war. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the United States made and NATO made it clear to Ukraine going into this that uh, we are not coming to your assistance. I don't know why Ukraine continues to labor under the false premise that someone is coming to their assistance. No one's coming to their assistance. Um, you know, that, that's that's just the reality. Uh, but the, you know, there, there, there's a couple issues here. One, Russia, by committing this 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 large amount of its conventional military force to Ukraine has exposed itself to a potential counteraction. Let's say NATO wanted to come in through Belarus uh, and take threaten St. Petersburg or threaten Kaliningrad. You know, the, the Russian forces that would have uh, opposed that are now in Ukraine. And so Russia said right off the bat, anybody who tries to interfere with this will be hit with punishment the likes of which they have never seen. That's sort of code word for, we're gonna nuke the hell out of you. Um, and Russia's not joking. Uh, wow. And immediately uh, everybody in NATO, whoa, wait, well, no, we're not threatening you. Don't uh, back down, calm down. All Russia was doing is putting a marker on the table saying, um, don't think you can exploit any potential weakness you see because we have everybody in Ukraine. We'll nuke you if you come after us. Um, so you saw i don't know if you've been seeing some of the u.s rhetoric about that but but they've been um there's been a couple of like you know little articles and people throwing it out on social media that are blue checks some there was one lawyer who said this um who said um we could have a limited nuclear war suggested there should be a preemptive strike what would you say, because you have a deep knowledge of these mess, these weapons that cause mass fatalities and destruction, what would you say to Americans engaging in that rhetoric, including some U.S. members of Congress and, you know, some of the people in Biden's administration? Well, you know, we, um, we, we, back uh, when, 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 uh, Putin first uh, mobilized his troops uh, along the, the, the border. Um, you know, it, when Donald Trump was president, um, there, there's this, uh, you know, there, there, there are these military philosophers who said, uh, you know, the Russians have a uh, nuclear strategy called um, escalate, de-escalate. Um, it's actually a total misreading of what they call the Gerasimov doctrine. Um, uh, and the guy who uh, wrote, wrote, you know, listened to a speech given by Gerasimov, who's today the head of the general staff of Russia, um, you know, he said, oh, there's this Gerasimov doctrine about, you know, uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, warfare, et cetera. But uh, one of the key elements is the notion of escalate to de-escalate, that the Russians will go all in early to intimidate you from backing down. And that in terms of nuclear weapons, Russia would... Uh, for instance, invade the Balkans and or the Baltics. And then, as NATO had its conventional, overwhelming conventional forces there, Russia would drop a nuclear weapon on them um, in an effort to escalate to get NATO to back down. And so, what the United States did is we developed uh, what's called a low yield nuclear warhead that we put on a Trident missile on a on a nuclear submarine, and we carried out a war a war game where the Secretary of Defense at the time. Um, espers actually pushed the button launching the missile with the nuclear warhead that in the game was being targeted against Russian troops in, near the Baltics. And the Russians went, are you insane? And Putin gave a speech. And again, people need to listen to his speeches. And he said, let me make it clear. We don't do escalate to de-escalate. We only use nuclear weapons if you attack us with nuclear weapons. And we don't play games. He said, let me put it this way. If you launch a nuclear weapon against us, we are all going to die, but you'll just be dead. We'll be martyrs, meaning <laughs> we'll be in the right. But, you know, it's a cold message. The Russians don't play around. If there's no a one wins war, is what he said. He said that in his Oliver Stone interview. He said it just a few days ago. He said it over and over. If there is a no war winners. like this, no one wins. 
no, everybody dies. He said that to, to Macron. He said it to everybody. Nobody understands that he's not playing games here. And that's why it's dangerous right now when you have idiots who think that, they could, that, that we can have a limited nuclear war with Russia, who think that NATO should fly a, a no-fly zone over Ukraine uh, deliberately to engage Russia so that we can have this low this, 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 this low level nuclear war. And to me, the fact that Europeans are tolerating this, you know, back in 1980s, we, uh, the treaty that I was involved in was the Intermediate Nuclear Weapons Treaty. And we, we ended up getting rid of a category of weapons that were threatening the world with global annihilation. Um, Could you repeat the, the name of the, of the treaty again, please? I'm sorry. Yep, the, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty or INF Treaty. It was signed in uh, December, 1987 between Gorbachev and Reagan. And, um, you know, prior to that, we had a situation where the United States and the Soviet Union were deploying these weapons into Europe. Uh, these weapons could literally, for instance, an American weapon could reach Moscow in, in, in seven to 12 minutes. And um, that means that there's no time to dis determine uh, once you detect the launch if there was a mistake or anything. So exactly. Everybody realized that this was very dangerous. We signed a treaty. We got rid of the weapons. Uh, and things settled down. Well, of course, Donald Trump got out of the INF Treaty. Uh, we immediately started building these weapons again, and now we're talking about redeploying them to Europe. So if Joe Biden has his way, the weapons that we recognized in the 1980s were bringing us close to global suicide are going to be reintroduced to Europe in an environment where Russia and NATO are at each other's, uh, you know, where, where there's, there's the potential of conflict. It's the dumbest thing in the world. And Europe um, is the killing ground. And you know, no, America's thing, not yeah. gonna get away either. No, no, first of all, every American city will, will be turned into dust. Um, but the Euro what I don't understand is the Europeans actually went to the streets in the 1980s. They overthrew, they forced out the government of uh, West Germany, um, uh, Helmut Kohl, I believe, uh, because he supported this deployment. Um, but the, 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 you know, the Europeans at the time said, we don't. We don't want this. This is. This is our cities uh, that'll be hit. Uh, these are our farmlands that'll be turned into nuclear wastelands. We don't. We don't want this. What do they think is going to happen today? What do they think is going to happen? Right. Europe, we turn into a nuclear wasteland. Um, I mean, just people aren't thinking right now. They've. They've let this anti-Russian. Uh, the russophobia it just it's yeah. it's all over it's it's the propaganda they're believing their own propaganda they're in their own echo chambers yep i mean it's it's it's, it's very sad so so okay scott so here we are we're in this historical moment moving from possibly a unipolar world to a multipolar world where it includes the the economies of 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 emerging india of of Russia, which is already emerging as a powerful force, China, of course, which is powerful, and, and maybe South Africa. So you have more of a, a turn to the East, if you will, for the future. Is that what the Western empire is fighting? Is it turn is because we're having this chasm in economic and cultural power that's turning East? Is that what this is? Well, when you say the Western world, there's actually two, two points of view here. One is the American point of view, which is um, they want to create a wedge between Russia and China to prevent this um, this this non-alliance that's stronger than any alliance that's uh, going on between Putin and Xi. Um, and so, you know, we were hoping that we could get Russia to uh, split with China or get China to split with Russia. Now, that's that's our that's our goal. Um, the Europeans had always said that. You know, we we don't like this strong arm game. You're playing Macron um, uh, and Merkel when she was in charge. We're very concerned that the United States was going to create a situation where Europe became the battleground between Russia and the United States. Well, that's exactly what's happened today. Um, so you, you they're coming at it from two points of view, but the the end result is uh, that you know, Russia is pivoting eastward. Uh, and that there is, you know, there's this uh, organization um, called the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, it's a massive organization uh, that includes Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Iran, all the various stands in the middle. Um, and they've created something called the Trans-Eurasian Economic Union. 
Um, in terms of population, GDP potential, et cetera, it dwarfs Europe. I mean, Europe is dwarfed by them. It, 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 there's, it, there's no competition. This is the future. This is the future of the world. What's going to happen with China in developing this Trans-Eurasian Economic Union? Um, uh, you know, China is taking over the, um, the, the supply chains. They're, they're taking over you know, the African economy. They're taking over the South American economy. They're taking over the Asian economy. Um, and, and basically, they're going to have a corner on the global economy that, um, that's going to push Europe and the United States aside, uh, make them irrelevant. You know, right now, the United States is, you know, the world's largest economy. Um, that's not going to be the situation in the near future. And Europe's going to find out the hard way that by imposing sanctions on Russia, when Russia kicks back, and we may hear something about that as soon as tomorrow, that um, Europe's going to be hurt a lot more than Russia is. And this is unsustainable for them. So, yeah, we're, we're looking at a, uh, look, there's an old Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. And it was a curse. It wasn't that's, meant good. that's the quote in my book. May you live in an interesting life. <laughs> well, we we are living an interesting life right now, and it's a curse. This is not a good time. It's a room. Time. Rumi had a quote. He said, "You know, and I, I don't want to miss. So maybe you know this quote, but somewhere among right doings and wrong doings, there's a garden. I'll meet you there." Let's let's hope that let's hope we can find that garden. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, I want to thank you so much for educating. Um, my listeners about historical context they might not be aware of for trying to present a, a, a view that's kind of, you know, outside the noise of just good guy, bad guy, football game, tiny stuff that we're doing in the West right now. And um, I really admire your work. Can you tell people one more time where to find it? And thank you for joining us. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And, um, you know, anything I do, I get, I post on um, Twitter at, uh, at real Scott Ritter. Okay, look, look, we'll look for you there. All right, everyone, thank you for listening and let's hope that there are more peaceful days ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm.